guys, welcome back to another episode of Born Star Confessions. Today I'm super excited. I've got the legendary Dolph Dietrich. Welcome. <laughs> hey everybody. Hey Jason. So God, with you, I don't even know where to start because I mean <laughs> Yeah, man, it's been a minute. You know, I've been doing this since 2012. Uh so yeah, it's been a ride. And you're retired ish right now. Yeah, I've changed that a few times on my Twitter. Um, I have an event coming up this September we'll talk about in a few minutes coming out of retirement. You know, kind of one of those things. It's hard to let it go. But um, for all intensive purposes, I am retired. I'm not filming anymore. Um, but, you know, I'm not retired from being a pig. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> okay, so let's start at the beginning. Like, where does your whole story begin? Damn. Okay. So, um, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm not from Germany as many people think with the name Dolph Dietrich. I'm I grew up in Boston. I thought that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm a, I'm a New England boy. I grew up in Boston. I'm a Boston kid. And, uh, I grew up and moved to the city of Boston when I was like 16. I dropped out of high school and I moved to the city, got my, uh, GD and I went to college at, at 18. Uh, for art originally, it was going to be a painter. Then I kind of blew off school at 18. And from about 20 to 30, I just had a really good time. It was basically all of the 90s was a blur for me. I lived in Boston. I was a bartender, had a great set of friends. I was uh, went to a lot of bands. I was really into the music scene in Boston. And then I uh, woke up around 30 and I was like, damn, I better do something with my life. Uh, so I went back to college. I went, yeah, I went back to college for the second time, this time with a, a graphic design degree. Graduated, you know, top of my class. Uh, got an internship right out of school at a magazine, a uh, nightlife magazine. And I started being an art director at this magazine, a junior art director, learning everything I could about photo shoots, lighting, um, model shoots, things like that. And ju I just fell in love with it basically. So fast forward, did that for a few years in Boston. And then I'm like, man, I got to take this to New York City. This is where it's at. This is where, you know, fashion and, and nightlife and all this stuff is at. So I got a job and many people will have heard of this magazine that are from New York or used to come to New York when magazines were big. It's called HX Magazine. And it was one of those rags that's like, they call it a rag, which is a bad thing to say, but it was like a little pamphlet you get oh. at every gay bar in the city. And it would tell you where to go. And it would have great photo shoots, porn stars, you know, porn drag queens, just everybody in New York was on the cover. So that was around 2008, I think. And I, that was my very first entry into the city. I moved to New York, started working at this gay magazine that was like the top of the line magazines for like everybody doing photo shoots with these beautiful porn stars and I was behind the camera. I was a skinny, still shy kid from Boston. I did not look like this. I just did not have the, I was very green when I moved to New York. I was very innocent and pretty shy. And then <laughs> I started getting go to, to go to the parties that I could go to because I worked at the magazine, um, working the photo shoots behind the scenes, just loving that job. It was really great. And that took me to uh, my next level of work my career in that industry. I worked at Rolling Stone after that. Oh, wow. So I went, I just jumped right in like two years in, in New York and I got a gig at Rolling Stone in the marketing department Damn. and I took it and I loved it. So I did graphic design and worked on big campaigns. Um, did that for a couple of years, jumped around 2009 came the, the economy crashed. Magazines were like tanking. People were like, what the fuck is a magazine? You know, like there's a thing called Facebook now. So all these things were happening. And I ended up moving up to Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is basically my hometown. I grew up uh, about 10 miles outside of it in a little town called Wellfleet. Um, that's where we spent our summers. And then my parents moved there. So Provincetown, Massachusetts has always been sort of my sweet place, my hometown. And I moved there as an adult and I got a job there working for the tourism board as the uh, art director of tourism. Uh -huh. And I was the marketing art director. So I did a bunch of cool photo shoots with some amazing people and did campaigns, 
billboards, you know, uh, all sorts of digital advertising, print advertising. I just loved it. I was the ambassador for Provincetown. But at the same time, I was living there year round. And in the winters, you probably heard Provincetown gets a little desolate. It's a little quiet and there isn't much to do. Um, so I ended up, like most people, beating off at their computer. <laughs> and while I was doing that, an ad came up for webcam models. And I'm like, hmm, I could be a webcam model. I could jerk off and make some money doing this. And by that time, I'd really worked at the gym. Like I got my body the way I wanted it. It looked tight. I'd gotten the tattoos in New York. I was confident. And I started doing webcam work from P-Town. Uh, the, I, and be, being a marketing director, I was like, my best client is myself. I'm going to market the fuck out of myself. I may not be the hottest guy in the world. I might not have the biggest dick, but I have something. I have like, talent in marketing. So I had this great photographer who gave me these photo shoots. He just loved to shoot me. And I, you know, worked out like mad. And then I marketed myself. I chose my name. Uh, I chose, you know, all the handles. And I worked all the marketing around as if I were my own client, which I basically am. To this day, I say market yourself, market yourself, market yourself, because it's the way to get your name out there. It's a little harder than today than it was back then, but we'll talk about that. Um, so yeah, that happened. And then uh, ended up falling in love with a French man and living in Paris, in between Paris and the United States. He didn't really like the porn gig, um, but you know, I fell in love with Paris, I fell in love with him. Didn't want to give up the porn, so we're still friends to this day. Then I met somebody else in the porn industry. Many people know that Drew Sebastian and I were a couple for a couple of years. Uh, he's amazing. We're still friends to this day. It was a beautiful relationship. We met on sets in San Francisco for a Treasure Island Media um, movie. I was the bottom. He was the top. Wasn't always that way in private, but uh, he's amazing. He's a wonderful man. We had a great time. Um, Fast forward, didn't work out. I'm lucky in love, but I'm very unlucky. Like I'm always in a relationship, but now I'm lucky today. I went to, uh, still doing the porn, just working it. My height of my popularity was around 2015, 16. And I met another porn actor named Hugh Hunter, which many of you might know. I remember Hugh Hunter. Uh, we met on a porn set <laughs> for Lucas Entertainment. And we fell in love and uh, we got married a year later oh. and we were together for a couple of years. Um, and then the pandemic hits, the pandemic hits sort of the defining moment for a lot of people in my industry, myself included. And um, we weren't doing so well. We weren't doing well as a couple and I decided to move on. I decided I wanted to try something completely different and new. And I said, fuck it, I'm going to go west. I'm going to move to Palm Springs, California. <laughs> so I packed my shit up. I said, you know, I love you, but we're separating. And then COVID happened, actually. So I had to live with him for like four more months while I made my arrangements. It was fine. But I ended up moving to Palm Springs, the height of the fucking lockdown. It's 120 degrees because I moved there like June. I don't know how to drive a car because I'm a city kid. I never drove a car in my life. What? And I was like, I just never drove. I've always lived in the city and I've always lived in New York City or Boston or what have you. So I moved to Palm Springs. I'm like, I'll be fine. I'm going to move right downtown, the center of everything. And I just, it was lockdown, like fucking lockdown. Anyways, that lasted not very long because I just, I woke up and I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? I'm not, I'm, I don't like it here. I felt like an interloper. I felt like I didn't belong there. Um, and I ended up turning right around six months later, hired a moving van, put all my shit. I had ad adopted a rescue dog while I was there. Took my rescue dog, Joey, got on a plane during the height of COVID, flew back to New York and moved into a, an apartment I took online. And then I met my current fiance, the man of my dreams, my life, my heart, Mr. Jack McEnroth, who many people know from uh, Project Runway season four. He was fan favorite on that show. That's how I knew him until I met him during COVID at the gym when we were both wearing masks. And he said hi to me. And I'm like, who the fuck are you, pretty handsome eyes, man? 
and uh, went up to him. I was like, he's like, it's me, Jack. We had I, we'd never really met. We just through media knew each other in the industry. He was doing OnlyFans at the time. Like his OnlyFans fucking exploded because everybody wanted to see Jack McEnroe fuck or get fucked. So <clears throat> I knew of him. And uh, we ended up going on a date with our dogs together. And that was almost three years ago. We've been through a lot. <laughs> I know that people have heard things, but dude, we worked it. We worked it out. You know, he's fought really hard to struggle through some issues with addiction. You know, I've supported him. We've done a lot of therapy, couples therapy, <laughs> singular therapy. And um, we're at a great place in our life. And we're engaged to to get married this year, his career is blossoming. He's now an esthetician. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at today. Yeah. And I'm here in New York and enjoying my life. And I don't really work in porn anymore. I work in corporate. I'm still in marketing in an industry that's, I work in the construction industry, actually. I'm a construction marketing specialist. So I create campaigns to sell skyscrapers and huge, arenas and shit like that. Holy shit. Yeah. So that's what I do now. So, so I'm curious when you were growing up, like, did you always know you were gay or what was, what was coming out like for you? Cause you're a big boy. Like, yeah, but dude, I was always like this shy, quiet, skinny, skinny kid. Like I was thinking about this earlier today. I was like, what am I going to tell Jason about like what it was like for me growing up? I had three older brothers and they were all hell on wheels. Like they were just in trouble with the law. They were burnouts. They would listen to like, you know, Zeppelin and fucking drink. And they would just like get high and wasted and have their friends over. And my mother was just horrified and whatever, but she kind of checked out at some point. So I was just this shy little kid with nobody my age to hang out with. I didn't have a lot of friends and I ended up becoming a goth kid in high school, like in the 80s, I met my group, my, my tribe, and it was these, you know, four goth kids that I went to school with back in 1987. And uh, I just fell in love with it. And that sort of formed me at that point in my life. Then when I moved to Boston, I just was, um, I was skinny, man. I was really, I was like 50 or 60 pounds lighter than I am now. I was skinny, skinny, skinny. And uh, it took me a long time to sort of build this persona that I am now. But I was not like I wasn't a cool kid. I wasn't popular. I would listen to the radio a lot. I was thinking about this today, and I'm like, I listened to like talk radio in my room alone, under the blankets, and I would think these people had such adult, you know, situations. You know, they would talk about. There was this woman named Dr. Laura. She's a fucking cunt. But anyway, she back in the day, I would listen to her, and I'd be like, oh, I want to be a grown up someday, so I can, you know, be in love and talk about these things and. I was a romantic. I'm still extremely romantic. I call myself pigmantic because I'm a fucking pig, but I'm also fucking romantic. Okay. I like that. Like, and <laughs> kind of tying into that, how in the fuck did you come up with the name Dolph Dieter? Cause I got to be completely honest. When I first got into this industry, I was like, motherfucker, you picked the best name. I was like, God damn it. Shit. Well, Dolph is for really Dolph Lundgren was my yeah. bait material to go to when I was a kid. He's still beautiful, right? He's a beautiful six foot five Russian dude, blonde. Dietrich is actually my mother's maiden name. So that's my family's name. Uh -huh. um, so I wanted the alliteration. I wanted the D and the D. And uh, it was funny because my mom passed. She passed right uh, in the middle of COVID. But before that, she would come to my apartment in Provincetown because she lived 12 miles away. She didn't know what I did, but she found this like CD back when we used to have CDs with like pictures on them from a photographer and he wrote Dolph Dietrich on it. And my mother saw it hanging out of my computer and she goes, Dolph Dietrich, who's that? That's, that's our family name. Is that someone we know? Is that someone that I'm related to? Like, who is that? And I was like, oh, geez, I don't even know what I said to her at the time. Uh, bless her heart. But she never... Yeah, she passed without really knowing. She was she was a cool lady, but it wasn't something I really wanted to like put on her plate. She had a lot of health problems at the end, and it, I just kind of was living my own life. You know? But yeah, so Dolph Dietrich, that's how that came around. Okay. 
And how did you get in to like bodybuilding and working out? Because you and I do have a similar backstory, and I want to get more in depth on that later. Absolutely. So, um, I've shared this story before, but it's worth repeating. I was born with a condition called pectus excavatum, which is a concave chest. Um, oh, yeah. It was severe for me. I had like a salad bowl inside my chest. It was very deep. Um, this whole area here would go like was inside of me. And I never took my shirt off. I didn't get it fixed till I was 34, 35. I remember just being the shyest kid still in my 30s, my 20s and 30s. I would go to Provincetown where all my friends would go when they're in my 20s. We'd go to the boat slip where everybody knows, right? I would never take my shirt off. At the pool, I'd have a t-shirt on. I'd have a t-shirt on in the pool. I was skinny and I had my chest, like the back of my back spine to the front of my chest was like, just like that. So I started going to the gym. Um, at some point, you know, as I turned 30, I started, you know, knowing that I had to sort of change. I wanted to change my look. But as I progressed at the gym, I didn't really know what I was doing. And my pecs were getting bigger, but they were getting bigger on the outside. And it was making the, the, the thing in the middle look like deeper and deeper. I was like, fuck this. So when I moved to New York City, I had a pretty good job at the time. I had good health insurance. And I campaigned with uh, the health insurance company to have this surgery done. It was actually breaking my stern and pulling it up, putting a metal bar in there and recovering for like a long time. Uh, finally got the insurance to cover it after a lot of times. Don't take no for an answer if you have a procedure. Just fucking hammer it home and they'll eventually have to cover you to get rid of you. Um, and I got the surgery done. And I remember the doctor saying to me when I was in recovery, which was so painful and like super fucked up. And he's like, dude, you have this done, but you, you know, you're never going to look muscular. You're never going to have this look that I think you want. He's telling me this like after the surgery. And I was just like, I was so bummed out. I was like, fuck that. I'm like, I'm that's just like, tell me, dare me to fucking yeah. do it. I will do it. So I had the gym hard for 10 years. And uh, well, it's been like 15 years since that. And that's kind of how I got into it. I mean, I love it now. It's like my therapy. I, it's where I go to blow off steam. It makes me feel good about myself. I enjoy it. Probably much like you. Oh, yeah. No, I can't. If I skip the gym for a day, let alone two, my mood, energy, it yeah. goes to shit. Um, uh, yeah. One thing, though, you had mentioned, the, the gentleman who had an issue with your job wasn't okay with the porn, the French guy. Yeah. How, like, because I hear that as like a reoccurring theme from so many performers I talk to where it's like, yeah. yeah. So was he okay with it? Like, uh, well, or is it? Kind of so like actually it was kind of, um, it, what it doesn't put paint me in the best light, the way that it completely happened because I was living in Provincetown. He was living in Paris and I was lonely. I missed him. I wanted to see him. And he had, he also had a lover and a boyfriend. It was very French. It was very complicated. And I wasn't getting, I need. I knew that. I knew that it wasn't gonna. He was never gonna move in with me. I was never gonna move to Paris, and I kind of acted out. But at that point, I was getting asked to do porn by studios, and I had said no, no, no. And then one day I said yes, and I didn't tell him, and I I did it, I filmed it, and it came out, and it was like playing in a bar in Paris, or something. and he found out. Like, so yeah, that is a really shitty, shitty thing that happened. Um, we, I, yeah, I, I, looking back on it now, it's funny because he loves my porn. He's like, <laughs> he's like, oh my God, I saw your porn again. You're doing this, you're doing that. And we're still like super close, but we didn't speak for like a year after that. But um, that was a situation where like, I've learned a lot. I've grown up. I would never sort of be that duplicitous with somebody again that I cared about. Um, it, but it happens. it happens. Dude, we have all made plenty of mistakes. God knows I've made plenty of them. Well, listen, that's the thing. Like after, after that, I was like, well, I'm probably only going to meet somebody in the industry. And I wasn't really trying to meet anybody. But when I met you, Sebastian, dude, it was fucking fireworks. That guy is awesome. Like, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. Yeah. 
um, you know, he's super talented at everything he touches. And we had so much fun together. And I did my first live sex show with him, which was amazing. And like, I became known, I think, for my live sex shows. I love doing them. But my first one with it was with him at Southern Decadence in New Orleans. And it's it was fucking insane. Like, they have these weird rules in, in New Orleans where it's like, you can't show hardcore fucking on stage in front of people because it's like this weird fucking rules. So they had us in like this light box showing each other fucking like our, oh my our uh, you know, shadows. So that's people okay, were like, though. Yeah. And I would stick my head out from the curtain as he was fucking me. And like, I remember just seeing the whole crowd of people and they were pissed off. So they ended up pulling down the, the curtains while he's fucking me. And we were just like, fuck it. He just fucking blew a load all over me in the audience. And it was my first live show. And I'm like, I love this. I fucking love it. And then we went to Folsom, we did a live shows there, and then we went all over the world. I've done shows all over Europe. Um, yeah, I fucking love it. Damn. Okay, so you truly are like an exhibitionist. Yeah, it's so funny because people that know me from back in the day in Boston when I was, I was so prudish, I was so shy. And now I'm just like, I mean, I've calmed down a bit. But back in, you know, five years ago, I was... Right before COVID, I had done like a shitload of live shows, some come dump things, and then um, COVID happened, and it just went, you know, like was like fucking stop. No. So that's what COVID did to me, and like it sort of, it made me wake up a little bit and just kind of be like, well, what am I going to do now? So, yeah, but I'm a fucking pig. Yeah, I'm I'm a pig, but I'm also like shy, and I think I'm kind of sweet. So I think that's a nice combination. Uh, would would you agree that you wear your heart on your sleeve? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Dude, I cry. I I cry at commercials. I cry at like the dodo dot com has like all those dog videos. I cannot watch dog videos without crying. Yeah. Um, I also have a, currently have a rescue dog. For anyone who's interested, um, his name is Andy. I got him at Second Chance Rescue in New York please, you know, consider rescuing a dog. A lot of them need it. This is Andy, by the way. Oh, my God. He's so <laughs> cute. Hey, hi, Andy. I yeah, know. He's a sweetheart. He's my little baby. I've got two myself. Do you? What kind? Uh, two rescues I have. One's a Chihuahua. Um, I got him during, like, the whole Paris Hilton thing. Because, yeah. like, when she was, like, at the height of her popularity, tons of women were going out and, you know, adopting chihuahuas because they just want a cute little accessory. And then, like, the shelters were, like, overrun with them. It's like, oh, shit, this is a living thing. Like, Yeah, yeah, it's that's fucked up. Yeah. Dude, all of my rescues have been chihuahuas. I can't believe you have a chihuahua. <laughs> I got to see the picture. Because before Andy, who's a, who's, like, a miniature poodle, I had rescued a Chihuahua in Palm Springs, two Chihuahuas in um, Chicago when I lived there with Hugh Hunter. And then, you know, sadly, they all passed because I rescued them as seniors. They were like 10, 11 and 12 when I rescued them. And then I got Andy as a foster. And I was like, oh, you know, a cute little poodle. I'll he'll get adopted real fast. But I had him for like two days. And he was just like, daddy. And um, yeah, I was like, "All right, you're you're my boy." No, it's it's honestly though not surprising that you and I both own Chihuahuas because I'm pretty sure even The Rock owns a Chihuahua as well. Like, Dude. it's always the big oh, motherfuckers. Do you get people on the street stopping you all the time? Because like, I'm six foot five. I'm two thirty. You know, I'm, I'm a big dude. I know you are. And like carrying around my little now poodle toy poodle, and then Chihuahuas, yeah. people are like. Oh, dude, that's so crazy. You're so big and they're so little. So yep. I do like that. Absolutely. It's, so so I, <laughs> when you first, like, okay, studios are contacting you, all that stuff. What was the straw that broke the camel's back where you're like, all right, let's do this? How did that happen? So I remember back in the day, the guy that I was communicating with, he owned a studio called Dickwad Media. Are you familiar with Dickwad? Sounds familiar. Yeah, they were like hard. They, I don't think they're filming anymore, but they film like hardcore fucking piss 
bareback, um, uh, just real dirty shit. Like even dirtier than Treasure Island. And I loved it. It was like my go-to get off. And um, I just somehow commute started, maybe I probably sent in my picture to the guy who, who owned the company. And he was like, yeah, sure, anytime you want. And then he sort of became a mentor a little bit for around the six months that I was like, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I would just talk to him and he was never, he was just always so cool to me. Um, big shout out to Big Juan Media and Dan Gita. Um, but he, he just talked me through, he's like, dude, whenever you're ready. And then finally I was like, I'm ready. And he flew me out to um, San Diego and him and Rob Roden, who is a legend in the industry. He was filming it. He was part owner of the company, such a sweetheart. They just took me under their wing. My first scene, I was screwed to a table, like with a electric um, screwdriver with the shackles and like eight guys just pissed all over me and fucking fucked me. And I was like, oh my God, I love this. <laughs> I love this. And we all went out afterwards and like had dinner and it was just really nice and San Diego was pretty and I'm like, oh, I love this. And I ended up having a little show romance <laughs> I didn't know what that was at the time, but I, my first scene was with this guy named Blue Bailey. Hey, Blue, if you're out there. And uh, he was pretty big at the time in the industry, and we ended up dating right away. I was like, oh, my God, I'm, I love you. We just filmed porn together. Let's date. And he was like, cool, be my daddy. But I wasn't ready to be a daddy at the time because he was like, daddy, daddy, daddy. And I'm like, I don't really know what that means. I don't know what I am. I'm still evolving. So now I can I definitely daddy identify. But back then, I was like, I don't know. I've always been sort of a twink. I'm. It's hysterical for me to hear you say that because, like, for the longest time, people were calling me daddy, and I would like cringe on the inside. I'm like, what the fuck? And then you just like, oh, actually, I kind of like this. Like, when did you say, fuck it, I like this? It was really. Um, it was maybe like eight, five, six, seven, eight years ago. And I definitely didn't identify with it, right? So, like, I went into, after that, dating Drew Sebastian. And that was great because we were more, like, I didn't even know if I was a top or a bottom. I'll be honest with you. I thought I was a bottom until I was, like, 30. And then I started topping. And I'm like, oh, my God, I like this. I'm good at this. I have a big dick. People like it when I fuck them. And I was like okay, so I think I might be a top or I'm versatile at the very least. And then the whole daddy thing didn't really come till I was at least like 45. I'm 52 now. And, um, you know, so like 45, I was like, yeah, this fits. This fits. I'm, I'm powerful now. Like I'm more powerful than I was back then. And that sort of comes with like this. I feel alpha. I feel um, in charge. I feel caring. I feel giving. I feel like a paternal man. Yeah. And I just, I love that. That's so that's, you know, daddy is an interesting way to evolve into it, but it's pretty organic. So speaking of the daddy thing, like that's what's in right now. That's what's fucking super popular. So yeah. I got to ask, why the fuck would you quit now? <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? But um, especially because I'm, I'm feeling more in charge of my brand and my sexuality right now than I ever have. I yeah. feel like I look fucking better than I ever have. <laughs> Um, I'm better at sex, dude. My dick is bigger. Like, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Like, I, everything is just right right now. But also what's very right right now is that I met the man of my, I met my future husband, right? It's like, I don't make any decisions without him. He doesn't, he also did porn. He's so cool with me still being Dolph. I know he would like Dolph to kind of go away and we just would like to get older and maybe retire down to Fort Lauderdale or Key West or palm springs or what have you but and that will happen but um yeah it's just kind of organic and plus you know what dude i have filmed with almost every small and major studio in this world i've done every kind of sex scene there is sure there's still things i want to try there's still people i want to film with but i filmed hundreds of scenes hundreds of movies live shows all over the globe and um yeah so i also would like you know, 401k and great health insurance and all that stuff. So I have that because I work in corporate now. And um, I also am very proud of what I do for my other, you know, life career. I'm very proud of my sex career, my sex work. Um, I'm very good at it. But I'm also extremely good and proud of what I do in marketing. 
So, so that's. Yeah. I'm curious, like you, when you said you're working for Rolling Stone, like because my undergrad, um, we probably share that in common. But what were you making at the time? Well, you know, they always I always try and make a a vertical move instead of a lateral move. So, you know, um, starting out of school, you start with a fucking, you know, shitty uh, salary in your 30s, 20s or 30s, whatever it is. And then I would always try and make, make it go up by like 10 grand for my next job or whatever it was per year. But Rolling Stone was was good, but it was right before, like I said, 2009. And so it was like 2007, I think. And the industry was good. I was making good money. I was in New York, but <laughs> I remember actually my ex-boyfriend was like, he's in Broadway and he needed to move to go do a show or something um, in Vegas. And he had this little SRO. I don't know if you know what that means. It's like a single room occupancy. And in New York, they have these tiny little fucking rooms and you have to share a bathroom in the hallway with other people. Oh. But it's just a room. Like it's nothing, right? It's like a jail cell. But he was like, oh, it's six fifty a month. It's in the heart of the East Village. It was right by the Cock, which is this legendary bar here. And um, I was like, dope. I'm like, I work at Rolling Stone. I make a shitload of money. If I pay this rent, which is six fifty a month, I'm going to just be on easy street. Yeah. Then I moved in there. And there's no kitchen, right? You have to share a fucking bathroom. Uh, everything I ate was like takeout. I had a microwave. That was it. And then... My fucking neighbor to the left of me got bed bugs. He was like an alcoholic, crazy guy. And the neighbor to the right of me got bed bugs. And they're like, you probably have fucking bed bugs. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. And I'm working my ass off at Rolling Stone. I had to put all my like shit in bags while they sprayed it. All this shit happened. And then I was like, fuck this. I'm out. I, and I moved back to P-Town. Like I've moved to Provincetown and back to New York City at least three or four times. Like moving, I'm so fucking sick of it. But back when I had the patience, I would just move to New York City and I knew I could make a lot of money in the summer. Bartending, I used to bartend there too. Fix drinks by the beach, get laid. I was just, I was living my dream. Um, so, I, but at some point it becomes, you know, <laughs> it becomes really unreasonable to, to do that. You know, I wanna be settled, I wanna, I want to grow my life with somebody else. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. But, but yeah, I was doing all right there. Okay. Doing better now. Nice. So one thing you had mentioned your passion about it is addiction. And like, obviously don't talk about anything you don't want to talk about. But like, how do I want to say this? The reason why I'm asking you this is because I've done a lot of monologues on addiction, stuff like that. And it's like one of my favorite quotes is sometimes you need to give up on people, not because you don't care, but because they don't. So how did you know with your fiance that, you know, it was going to get better versus I'm sure you've known at least one person where their partner struggles with addiction, where it's round and round and round and round and round and in and out of rehab for 20 years. And you're just like, dude, this is shit's never going to get better. How, how yeah, do you tell the two apart? That's a really good question. You know, and I didn't know at the time I questioned myself constantly because, um, you know, I met him, I fell in love with him. I didn't realize he was a drug addict. Right. And, you know, what happened was like, I found out about it when we were doing porn. Like we had opened like a studio together and we were like filming only fans and shit together. And it just kind of crept in. And I was like, Oh fuck, dude, he's sick. Right. So, so this shit happened. And then, um, I was trying to really, I was trying to piece out of it. I was like, I don't need this in my life right now. I love him, but it's not worth risking myself. Right. Yeah. So, but I did love him and I'm a caring guy. So I got him into rehab. I, he couldn't do it himself. I figured it out with his family, got him out there, got him to a different state. He went to rehab. And then I thought, you know, like I did my thing. I'm done with it. Wow. I escaped narrowed, you know, like 
things with this person that could have happened really even worse than they did. They did. But then during, um, that was during the pandemic, he was staying in touch with me against, you know, better judgment. I was taking his calls from rehab and really being like checking in with him, you know, how's, how's this, how's that going? And then when he got out, he had a lot of shit to deal with, a lot of like reparations with the people, um, myself included. But I, I don't know. I honestly, when I when I took him back and I said we're gonna work on this together, it's it's because I just saw this side of him that was just fucking beautiful, right? Like, and this addiction shit, which I'm not an addict and I I have never been one, luckily. Um, I just saw it take over this beautiful man's life and it killed me. And it's not the first time I've seen it. Right. So like I've other people in my life that I've seen addiction just ravage and I don't hate the addict. I hate the addiction. Right. But it's really hard when they fucking fuck with you and do shit in your life to hurt you. Um, that being said, like, yeah, if it wasn't for him being who he is, I wouldn't have gone back with him. But um, I, get, I lost some friends over it, to be quite honest. Some friends who knew the situation, which really bummed me out because they don't know what happens. You know, they don't know what I've seen or what I've, what he's really been through at the end and the work that I've seen him. He's grown so much. Um, so, yeah, it's a personal decision. Anyone in this situation who loves an addict, like I feel for them because it's like, you know, you got to make your own decision. I, I don't think anybody, his family was like, if you fucking left right now and, you know, never talk to him again, we would totally get that. So um, I decided not to. And I'm, I'm so happy I did because, um, yeah, I don't think I, I could have done this with anyone else. <laughs> but with him, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. But Yeah, no, it, it does because I, I don't think there is a clear-cut answer for it. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I don't know. Is yeah, that, that addiction is just oh god. Yeah, and you know, I was listening to one of your, your interviews yesterday with um, my buddy Dallas Steele, um, which is great. He's a great guy, and you were talking a little bit about addiction and how you uh, part of the reason you do these YouTube things and your your podcast and things is to you know sort of dispel this myth that all porn stars are you know sort of like tragic, yeah. you know drug drug adults individuals and um it's so true i mean i've been in this business for so long now and yeah i've had some experiences with some people who were off their fucking tree unfortunately and maybe found their way back or maybe not i don't know but for the most part like it, it's been 100 percent professional and great and lovely and you know you can be in the drug world if you want to be. You don't have to be in porn. It really, they don't go hand in hand. They just don't. Yeah. I never saw it like that. Yeah, no, that's so true. And one thing, like, obviously at the end, I'll give you an opportunity to plug all your content. But there was one thing, though, that you had messaged me about that, frankly, I didn't know I existed. I, I interviewed um, uh, Kay Strauss. And he was talking about his dick implant. And that was like the first time I'd ever heard of that shit. And that was like mind blowing to me. And then like, what you sent me, I was like, what? Like, I went and got my fiance. I'm like, you got to see this shit. Like, what the fuck? All right. Let me, let me dispel a couple of myths here. First of all, I have not had, we're going to talk about my asshole first. I have a very pretty asshole. I'm very proud of it. It's pretty, right? It wasn't always like this. I did not have asshole rejuvenation as many people, many, many people have asked me. I had back in the day when I was prepping my body or getting ready for this career that I didn't even know I wanted. I had like fissures in my asshole. I had a couple skin tags. I would get hemorrhoids. It wasn't cute for a bottom, yeah. right? Not cute at all. And I was like, oh, I don't like any of this. I went to this doctor and I got him uh, to take off those skin tags. And I remember saying to him, I'm like, I want my asshole to look fucking pristine pretty. And he's this older proctologist on the Upper East Side in New York. He's like, well, I want it to look pretty. And I'm like, I just do. Anyways, he did the surgery. Fast forward. I've never had another hemorrhoid. My ass is beautiful. It's just really pretty. So that's my asshole. My cock is another story. I had um, used Trimix 
a lot, right? Yeah. So Trimex, for those who don't know, is an injection in your penis um, with chemicals that give you a hard on for a certain amount of time. It can be dangerous, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Yes. You need to have the antidote, which is called phenylephrine. And if you don't have the antidote, which I didn't for the first five or six years I was doing it, you can get into some real trouble and end up getting what's called a preupism. And preupism is where the blood does not move out of your penis and you have to go to the hospital and get it drained. And it's horrifying. So it happened to me. And um, I remember I was in a shoot with Charlie Harding. I'll never forget it in San Diego. And I couldn't get my boner to go down. And I was with Hugh Hunter at the time. And I was like, I have antidote in my refrigerator in New York City. I'm in fucking San Diego. (laughs) So not really a smart decision, right? I'm like, I can make it back to New York. I can make it back to New York, right? I didn't know. I get on the plane, right? I get back to my apartment. I grab the antidote like 12 hours later. It's like four in the morning. I'm shooting into my dick. I shoot it like two vials in there. It does not go down. I end up going to the hospital in East Village in New York. They had to drain it. It was horrible. It was disgusting, right? There's like blood. It turns into this huge eggplant. It's purple. It's gross. I was supposed to go to London like two days later and film and all this stuff. Cancel that whole trip. Thankfully, my dick was not going to like implode or fall off. But what happened was it was this really weird phenomenon. Over the next several years, I would get these phantom boners, right? So it was as if there was something that would trap the blood in my penis. When I would lay down, mostly it was when I was horizontal, immediately my dick would go boop and it would be hard as a fucking rock. And people think, oh, that's so cool. You had a hard dick all the time. And I'm like, it was fucking pulsing hard, like yeah. boner, like blowing my, my mind too hard, like hurting me. Yeah. And so like for two years, I was like, I went to a shitload of urologists. I told him the story of what happened. This all happened after the preopism. And in the whole time, my dick is like pulsing full of blood hard for months and years now on end. <laughs> like, oh my God. So it was basically like being in a cock um, pump, pump yeah. for like two years. My cock was just being pumped, pumped, pumped. Oh. And it got bigger. And I was like, Oh my God, dude. And then I, I was in Madrid filming with this porn star and the Spanish guy. I told him the story and he's like, dude, that happened to me too. He's like, don't worry. After about like two years, it just goes away. And sure enough, like right almost to like two years to the, t- to the month, I had some relief and the pressure went down. I wouldn't get a hard on constantly. And, um, but by that point, like it had been stretched so much from getting these boners that it, it was physically bigger. Like, it's just so much thicker. So I do not recommend that to anybody because it was hell and it was super dangerous. And I got lucky with the results because now I can get a boner pretty easily. And um, it's like a lot bigger, but it's like, I don't recommend that to anybody. It was, it was rough. And it was just like this weird fucking medical coincidence that no one really explains to me how it happened. Um, so that's the story of my bigger dick. Um, and my pretty ass. So I was I was meant for this industry, dude. I'm like, I. But, you know. Okay, I. Did, I all right. What the fuck, dude? No, I had the exact same thing where I was prescribed Trimax. Didn't know about the ando. I had a priapism. Like it was a late night shoot. I had to be up early for class the next morning, so I went to bed. Just put ice on it. Took Ben. I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, it'll go down. Woke up in the morning, went to the fucking ER, same shit, had to get drained, woke up and pulled my own blood. However, I did not get the benefit you did. My dick was like this big around, swollen, black and blue. It took like nine months for the discoloration to go away. Yeah, dude, it's hardcore. So like anyone that's going to try that shit, you know, try and have the antidote on hand, like if you can't, there are options you can get at the drugstore. I don't really want to like recommend anything to anybody, but like, you know, just get your ducks in a row before you do it. Cause you do not want to end up having that happen to you. But um, yeah, I, I'm glad it worked out for you. I know a lot of people in the industry it's happened to mine is the only story that I know of that where, except for that other porn star um, where it happened and then just kind of constantly gave me yeah. a heart on for two years. So so that's my dick. 
so the body thing, that stuff is something I'm super curious about because okay. like I'm sure me and you, I'm, I'm guessing you're the same as me where you look in the mirror and you still see that skinny kid. Oh, you totally. can never be I, big I enough. Me. You're never satisfied. No. Sometimes I catch myself in the mirror at the gym and I'm like, whoa, look at that fucking stacked daddy. And I'm like, oh, that's me. <laughs> like, I just never even know. Like, I'll, I do once in a while look at myself in the mirror when I'm fucking my boyfriend, my husband, or what have you. And I'm like, wow, I look fucking good. And like, I, I like that. But generally, like, in my head, what I think of myself is like, if I close my eyes and think of myself, it's not what I see, yeah. right? So the whole thing with like body dysmorphia is like one thing, but you know, I worked really hard to look a certain way. And then when I turned 50 um, and COVID was happening, right? Like I put on weight. I never thought I would get to this. Like I got to 230, which was cool. Cause for a six foot five, 230 guy, but it kind of went in the wrong areas. I didn't like, it went like in my flanks and my stomach and my abs and um, just, Woke up one day, and I had bought these custom-made chaps from a guy, and I was like, oh, trying them on. I'm like, look in the mirror, I think I look so good. Taking pictures, I'm like, whoa, that's not right. So immediately, Jack and I went on a keto diet. This was last March, because we were going to Mexico in February, when we wanted to look cute in our swimsuits. Ended up losing 10 pounds like that from eating clean. Uh, but the extra weight, I wanted to lose 10 more, and it just wouldn't come off. So... I did some research and I looked into um, liposuction thinking like, you know, the weight does really manifest itself at a certain point, a certain age in areas that I didn't want. Went to this amazing guy, Dr. Steinbrick uh, at alphamaleplasticsurgery.com. And he gave me a whole sort of like menu of things I could do. Um, One of them being liposuction with body banking. Body banking is like, BBL, you know, the Brazilian butt lift, Uh, it's fat transfer. So they'll take fat from my body, uh, which is going to be in my flanks and my stomach area, and they're going to remove it, but they're also going to transfer it into my chest. So into my upper chest here and the sides in the the middle here, where Mm -hmm. it's lacking because of my original issue, which was pectus excavatum. So I'm going to get bigger titties and a skinnier waist. And I'm excited for that. What? Um, he specializes in males, only males. And so, like, this this, this is, like, the most amazing plastic surgeon I've ever met. Really excited. I'm going to be an ambassador for him, doing some things. You can all follow me on my handles and check it out, what I'll be doing over the next few months. But I'm really excited to share this with everyone. And I think it's really important um, to talk about and not have a stigma about plastic surgery. Oh. I have my eyes done. And all I've had done so far is... My teeth and some Botox. So we're looking forward to the liposuction, which is happening this September. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. I, like the teeth, I got those done back in May. I, yeah, those look dazzling, beautiful. But wait, so like, you got to explain this to me, like I'm a golden retriever, because oh, yeah. like my knowledge of plastic surgery is like you said liposuction brazilian butt lift and like breast implants like for a woman yeah they can transfer it to your chest so yeah the the fat process these are living fat cells right when you remove them you can transfer them to your to your calves Mm -hmm. um to your chest to your biceps to your shoulders and it's living fat cells right so when i have that done um, I need to make sure that I feed myself, right? Or else they're going to absorb. So I need to make sure I'm eating well. I need to gain about 10 pounds for the surgery. And I need to keep eating after to make sure everything's living. And this is the fucked up part. When I gain weight in the future, when I do have the fat transferred up here, and I gain weight, it's going to gain weight in those fat cells. Instead of being in my stomach, it's going to make my chest look bigger. So I said to the doctor, I mean, like, you can, I can fucking pig out and I get fatter, but in my tits. What? And he's like, that's exactly it. <laughs> it's crazy. So, um, yeah, it's called body banking. And it's not like, it is actually, you know, lots of plastic surgeons do it. But this particular one specializes, like I said, in males. And, like, I'm getting something called gladiator abs, which are, like, you know, I look, I'm going to be fucking jacked. So, like, the abs that I had for all of my career... I had the 
just smoking abs. And I was like, I didn't even work that hard at it, to be honest. Um, but I did work hard, but uh, they went away. And I'm like, where the fuck are my abs? So after this surgery, they're just going to be chiseled out, tiny waist, and my tits are going to be bigger. What the so, fuck? Yeah, Dude, man. Fucking like, technology in medicine is crazy. It's amazing. So you could it's add amazing. that to your arms, like you said. Yeah, totally. Oh. Totally. Could add he's gonna add it probably like um all here. I also have scars all over me. This this is another scar I have. Um and here, like in the center of my chest. What? Yeah, so it'd be like boom. Jesus. Okay. So I'm excited. Yeah. Pla Alpha male plastic surgery dot com. Check it out. Dude, yeah. that is insane. Okay, so the million dollar question though is how much does this cost? <laughs> well, um, prices can be, you know, pretty exorbitant when it comes to stuff like that. But I think about it as like this is the you know, this is an investment I'm taking my the first time I did the surgery right when I was like thirty five, that took me now to fifty two. And this is going to take me to the you know rest of my life. The other thing too, once the fat cells are removed, they don't grow back. So you, um, so like they're going to remove them from where I don't want them and put them where I do want them, and they're not going to grow back where I don't want them, right? So you'd have to like just go off the rails, I guess, and get three hundred pounds for that. But um, yeah, I mean, prices price is difficult. But like, hey, listen, I don't have kids. I'm a gay man. I have a dog that I love. And a man that I love, and I love his dog, and that's what we spend our money on. We spend our money on um, vacations and, you know, maintaining our the way that we want to look for the rest of our lives. So that's what's important to me. If I had kids, I probably wouldn't be able to do this. So, Yeah. I mean, you're right, though. Like, because my teeth, I mean, my teeth I got done in Mexico, and they were still 20 grand. And I'm like, Ugh. But it's like, yeah, dude, once they're like, done, they're done. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, I finance my teeth. And like, you know, um, I, I I believe in that. Like, the, my smile, I, I think is so important. It was the first thing I did. And it was something I always wanted to do was get veneers. For anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about. Uh, it's called veneers. But it's a very permanent uh, decision. You file, the doctor will file down your teeth completely into little nubs and then fit you for these um, veneers, right? And it's it's just one of the best decisions I've ever made. Oh, yeah. I love it. Um, I feel like my smile has improved. I just, I smile all the time. And now, you know, I'm taking it to the next level with this uh, liposuction. It's not for everyone, but, you know, I want you guys to f follow my journey and see how it is for me. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right, though, because, like, my only regret with my teeth was not having done it sooner because yeah. before getting it done, there was two pictures in 40 years of me smiling. Now I'm yeah. like fucking smiling every other pic. Like so no shit. Yeah. It's, Dude, I know and, my, my, yeah, my husband has his, had his done like 20 years ago. He was one of the first people to ever do it. And um, I was like, Oh my God, I love your smile. And so now we smile a lot. <laughs> But, like, I can only imagine what that would do for someone's body, though, you know? Because, like, everyone distributes their fat differently. Like, some people hold it in their legs. Some people hold it in their stomach. Some people hold it in their love handles. And the idea of changing that distribution, that's shit. Yeah, dude. I mean, like, I just never, like I said, until I turned a certain age, I never had to worry about that. I mean, I worried about my, you know, I have things that everyone has things they'd like to do, right? Yeah. Like, I wish my legs were thicker, um, but they're not. I'm six foot five. I'm a fucking basketball player, you know, ectomorph. Um, but, you know, it's all about, like, choosing what you want to do with, with yourself. And if you want to do something medically, I support it. I think it's, it's great to feel good about yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let's see. One of the questions someone submitted is... You filmed with Ari Coyote. He was my yeah. BS, best sex I ever had. Nice. <laughs> He's so smoking hot. Yeah, no, he is. Oh, fuck. Ah, yeah. 
I know. Get me all worked up. So, anyways, um, ask him how it felt and how does it feel different from popping an ass. So I'm um, I'm a fucking pig, right? We're both we're both pigs. We know that, right? I never really thought about having sex with a trans man um, until it was offered me, right? Like my boyfriend loves sex with trans men. He loves pussy. Um, he loves uh, whole. It's just all good for him. But for me, it was a decision that I was offered and I thought about it for like two minutes and I was like, fuck yeah, let's do this. And like, just like my, my evolution of becoming Dolph and every, like I never like fisted anybody till I fisted Drew Sebastian on set for, um, for Falcon media. And that was a whole nother story. But like, I try a lot of these things for the first time on camera. And then if I like it, I go back and I try to private it. Cause that's where I'm really even piggier. Um, I like the organic sex. I like it without cameras a lot. So sorry, but porn, but that's what happens. So when I tried that, um, it was, it was great. It was amazing. But again, it wasn't as natural as I wanted it to be. I would love to go back and fuck Ari again or another uh, trans man like with my partner because he loves it. He'd like just fucking eat his pussy and fuck it. I'd fuck it. And, like it would just be great. So that's on the list of things to do again in pri- probably in private. Sorry, <laughs> maybe film it, but now I'm not really filming anymore. So there you go. But uh, yeah, it felt great. But um, I wish I remembered it more clearly just because it was it was sort of filming and it was like my mind wasn't a hundred percent there and I didn't know what, I didn't even know what a fucking vagina looked like. You know, the first one I've ever really seen. <laughs> and, um, but it was hot. It was hot. So yeah, I want to redo. I want fucking trans men hit me and Jack up. I'd like to fuck you. Be patient with me. I'm, I'm a good daddy. So I'm curious. Cause you mentioned it. What is sex? with you like off camera versus on camera yeah well so like as you probably know like for following me like i have uh, a big foot fetish community that follow me um which like again some people love some people don't i happen to find that i like it i found it out like about five years ago i just would always check out men's feet the first time i met them when they're flip-flops or whatever and um so that's really cool um Sex with me, uh, I love, I'm an, I've escorted as well the whole time I've been doing this. And, you know, escorting, I think, I just love it. I feel like I'm um, connecting with another man so deeply and closely, and that that's always fun. So it's a little bit more organic than filming. Um, and then, like, I vacillated between being this big power cum dump, which a lot of people know me as, which has been the case, and then this big dominant top, right? So like, I'm totally both. I'm of Gemini, I'm totally verse. Lately, I'm, I'm definitely leaning towards the more dom top side. Um, I just I love to fuck, I love to lose myself in a hole. <laughs> and a person, my husband particularly, has the best hole in New York City. And I just, I love lingerie on a hot, sweaty, muscular man. Like, I, I remember all these things that I was into and I was always like, I'll never even get to play that or like and now it seems to be more common you know like especially the thing with like lingerie on on like hot men like there i see that a lot and i love it i fucking dress up jack in the prettiest little panties and lacy little fucking you know things and like just fucking nail his cunt and like i love it so yeah i don't know sex with me is fun because i just i'm always sort of like evolving and um yeah I'm super versed. I love flipping. Okay. <laughs> Do you enjoy being so well hung or are there ever moments you consider it an annoyance? <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, well, like that time, <laughs> no, let me think. Um, generally, I really enjoy it. I'm not going to lie. Like I used to not like being tall, right? I'm six foot five. Now I fucking love it. Like it's, it's what sets me apart. My dick isn't that long per se, but it's just thick. My girth is intense, especially since that procedure I told you about. Um, So there there are men who cannot, you know, take it. Um, But, you know, the majority can. The majority that I meet or have sex with are, you know, completely willing. 
But being a good top, you know, I definitely have to take my time with this dick on men. And they have to, if they don't use poppers, then I let them go on top and I let them ride me and I let them get comfortable. But as soon as I have that sense of when it's open and then I'll just fucking nail it. Like there's no going back. So, um, yeah, I love being hung. And it's perfect for me because my boyfriend is a big, filthy bottom beast and he can... I don't even need lube sometimes when I fuck him. I mean, like the tiniest little bit of spit and his puss just... Oh, wow. Okay. It's awesome. I'm a, I'm a super lucky man when it comes to that. Um, so, yeah. No, I love having a big dick. Okay. What was the thing, person, or event that influenced you, made you decide to become an iconic cum dump? Oh, the come come dumb stuff, right? All right, so like we come, you know, I think you're similar to my age, but like back in the day, you know, HIV and AIDS was like when I was 17, 18, it was 1987, 88, right? The height of it. And I'm figuring out my sexuality. And um people are like you got to you got to use condom, you got to read. I think it's one of the reasons I was really uptight about sex or like many people yeah for many, many, many years. Um, and then the whole culture changed, right? With the, uh, with the, the great way that, you know, anti-inhibitors and all the things that happen, you know, with HIV medication and with people being able to take PrEP and all that stuff. Um, so I jumped on the bandwagon and like, I remember, now you see on Twitter, like everyone's like, hotel come dump here, there, come dump here, come dump here. It's great, right? It's fucking great that we're all embracing this. But back then it was like not a lot of people were doing it. So I would know that I was going to a city like Fort Lauderdale or LA and I would arrange with the local bathhouse to let me do a come down. They didn't have to pay me. I was like, I'll just do it and then I'll work it into my schedule because I'll be working here and doing this and doing that. So it was really fun. I mean, I used to work at these, uh, do it at these uh, clubs called like Flex spas in Cleveland and Steamworks in Chicago and Slammer in um, Fort Lauderdale and Steamworks and this club called um, the probably the best one I ever did was called Fucked FK FKD in Toronto right the fucked party and it doesn't exist anymore they might come back but the right before COVID I did my major um, load taking night there in Toronto it was like March 13th, 2020, and I took 80 loads, and it was fucking brilliant. So after that, I was like, and then COVID happened, it was locked down. And I don't know if I'll ever reach that record again, but that was probably the ultimate experience for me. It was something about it was just very cool to me. I tend to like to just turn into this machine or like almost shut off my brain when I'm a cum dump, just turn into an object, like a muscle fucking whore hole <laughs> and it's something like it's kind of like i go out of my body without drugs and you know i really enjoy that like enjoy just disassociating myself and just becoming an object for men's pleasure like it's it's kind of it's kind of liberating 80 honest, but 80 dude what the holy shit yeah Oh, yeah. I wow. Okay, I I will never catch you. Jesus. Yeah, that was that was a, that was like you know, and like it was over like four or five hours. So it's like, and there was a line. Actually, the first time I, re- I did that, one other time, I did a couple times this club called Hard On in London. Shout out if you're ever in London, check out this club. It's like once a month called Hard On. It was the first one I ever did with the first cum dump I ever did with Drew Sebastian by my side. We held hands and we took loads in London for like four hours at this club. And it was really fucking, that was the first time I knew. And I'm like, oh, I, I like to do this on occasion. Um, I haven't done that in a while. How in the hell did your ass not give out? Dude, I don't know. My ass snaps back. Like I have a real pretty asshole. You see some guys who like, you know, they don't, you got to put some vitamin E oil on that shit, dude. And like, I would get guys a lot who ask me about my asshole regimen because it is really pretty. And like, it's, it's, you know, it's not blown out or anything, but I haven't been doing this for, you know, 
40, 30 years. I've only been doing it for like a certain amount of years. And I didn't do it, you know, maybe once every few months. So it snaps back. Body is an amazing thing. I've only been fisted once. And that was by my current partner. And I didn't like it. But then I fist. I love fisting. I'm a fisting cop. Uh -huh. So one thing that you and I have in common is the girth. And when guys can't take it's it concerned. or guys are way too tight, that's like my pet peeve. When they, I'm just like, yeah. dude, this is not good. This is physically fucking painful. Now, yeah, dude. If anyone can give a master class in how to bottom, like golf's 101 on anal, go. Yeah, man. Like, um, yeah, I, the girthier dicks are fun, right? Like, I love them personally. I've seen yours. It's very pretty, Jason. I'm just maybe someday we can. So, um, but I, how to be a good bottom. I, I think being a good bottom is like, important if, if you're top like i am definitely all the times i've been fucked helps me figure out what i like and don't like right i always start eating out a guy first like i love eating whole and getting him nice and wet and i can i like getting my whole eaten before i get fucked right and then um you know just don't be like a fucking jackrabbit like that nobody really loves that right nobody really loves it like i was mentioning before like if you're thicker and you're girthier like I, I will open up your fucking cunt and like in a very slow, methodical way. And as the top, I will know when you're ready to get, to get pounded. Yeah. And like, I'm guys who don't know that. Like I've had guys as one guy had a come dump. I was so pissed off, man. He had a um, Prince Albert, right? The dick ring. Yep. And he fucking shoves it into me so fast and so hard. Like I ripped and that was, I had to take, I was planning on taking like 40 loads that night. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? I got, I was so pissed. So like, just if you're going to be a top, right? Like have some respect for the bottom. That if they're taking a bunch of loads, like just don't fucking hurt them, finger them with fucking long fingernails and shit. Like don't do that. And then being a bottom is like, there's so many good tutorials out there. I don't even want to say like, I'm the best bottom ever. Because I'm not. My boyfriend is so my husband's a better bottom than me. And there's so many bottoms I keep in touch with all over the internet, right? When they do their come dumps, I send them encouraging messages. I'm a champion of them. I'm like, Daddy wants you to do it. Take all those loads, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and um, they know what they're doing. Like, they, they, like, times have come far. But uh, again, like, I hope I'll, I'll be able to do another one someday soon. Um, it's just that I have a lot going on with like my partner and the marriage, the wedding and surgeries and things like that. So, but once that gets all underway, we'll be ready to party and play. So what, like for someone who is bottoming and is having difficulty relaxing, what advice would you give them? Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and that's assuming you don't like poppers, right? Because Poppers definitely help. Um, amyl nitrate is like uh, bottoms best. Friend. I've had plenty so, of bottoms even with poppers. It feels like a really script. Yeah, I mean, dude, like that's at the that point where you're just like, you gotta fucking just suffer through a little bit of pain if you want a big girthy dick like you and me. Like, I I can't you know make it smaller or thinner. Or anything. I wouldn't want to. Like, I'm always like you're here because you want. My doll, my doll featuring fat dick. So you better suck it up. So I don't really have a lot of problems with that. But, um, you know, once in a while, recently I had a client and he was like, oh no. He's like, no way. He's like, oh, can I just fuck you? And I'm like, okay. So, I mean, generally, like you and I are definitely above average, but, uh, you know, it's not always my problem to figure out the bottom should be practicing with a dildo, right? Like, if you want to take big, thick, fat dick at a drop of a hat. I mean, I couldn't do it today because I haven't had a dick up my ass in a while. But like when I was bottoming and I was doing a lot of cum dumps, I would practice at night with my dildo in the shower. You know, Jack has a dildo in the shower and he like just fucks himself with it while he's taking a shower because he knows I'm going to plow him later or whatever. Like that's if you're going to be a bottom, keep it open. Keep it open for business. <laughs> So one person wanted to know, would you ever 
Well, they said, would you ever do straight porn? Assuming you stay retired, would you ever have... We'll just change it to, would you ever have sex with a woman? I mean, I wouldn't put anything off the table at this point because mm, I've tried everything. Like, And I'd probably do a bisexual scene before I would just jump to like a woman on man me scene. Um, yeah, I can imagine like a bisexual scene, like just fucking... Yeah, I, I, I've imagined the, the logistics of it, like how it would work and having a guy's cock and like a hot pussy together and me getting my face in both. Like, I mean, come on. Why wouldn't I want that? Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> so what are you like in your private life when you're not Dolph? Like, well, what do you do for fun? What makes you yeah. tick? So, so, um, yeah, I live like a lot more boring life than most people think, you know, like I'm pretty much a homebody. Like Jack and I love, uh, we both have rescue dogs. Like we've talked about, uh, we love our dogs. We love our time together. I, I'm, I love cooking. I'm a rather good chef. I love grilling. I don't have a grill at this moment, but once we, um, move into a house with a little bit bigger space, I'll, I'm the grill master daddy. Uh, and I, um, what do we love doing? Oh, we love going to the gym. <laughs> you know, that's exciting. Like, we love having sex. Uh, like, I love my job. I like working. I love working. Um, you know, what I'm doing for, for my job right now is full-time corporate. Um, but when I'm not working, I basically just love to spend time with Jack. It's just great. We, what, we stream movies. You know, we, we're still, like, in our COVID phase almost where we're, like, we just nest. I unfortunately have guys come to the city all the time that send me messages and they're like, dude, where's the party to hit up this weekend? And I'm like, honestly, I have no fucking idea. I'm like, I'm going to bed. It's like nine o'clock because I got to go my trainer in the morning or something. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're we, I, I keep saying to Jack, I'm like, we got to get out there. We got to, you know, meet more people. So, like, we save it off for vacation. Um, but we should be a little bit more social in New York. But we just love spending time with each other, really. So. That's about it. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was having that conversation with my best friend the other day because we were like, fuck, man, we used to go out to eat like way more before like the pandemic happened. And then like yeah. we got used to not going out to eat. Now we're like much happier just getting takeout and watching like a Netflix documentary eating. Yeah, I'm curious, yeah. like what things did you stop doing because of COVID and then you're like, Oh, actually I don't need that to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Like I was traveling like crazy. Like I said, those last couple of weeks before COVID happened, I was, I was in DC. I was in Europe. I was in LA. I was everywhere. Like just filming, doing cum dumps, whatever I was doing. And then when all that stopped, I was like, Oh my God, that was so hard. The past 10 years have been so hard traveling, like traveling sucks. Now when I travel, I'm like, I have to deal with the fucking planes and the seats and, you know, luggage and all that shit. So I haven't really traveled as much um, since COVID, and I don't miss that at all. Um, you know, I kept – that. that's about it. I mean, can't really think of anything else that I, I've missed so much. But um, I love to cook now more, like definitely do less takeout. <clears throat> I love to, to learn and cook and do things for, um, and take care of my husband and my dogs. Damn. Yeah. So what's your specialty when you cook? Um, well, tonight over there on the kitchen, I have a ribeye steak that's becoming room temperature. So I can cook it um, on my little grill on the oven and some zu baby zucchini and some, um, what am I going to make? Maybe roasted fingerling potatoes. I usually was on this keto oh. diet, which is nothing like. Sounds good. And uh, probably like a little balsamic red wine reduction and some rosemary. So I think I was doing a no keto thing or, or rather a keto diet until my surgeon uh, for my surgery coming up in September said, you need to gain like 10 pounds and you need to eat like rice and bread, whole grains, rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, like everything that I avoid the fuck out of okay. for like the past year or long, my whole you know, adult life. So now I'm like slowly incorporating these things back in like potatoes tonight, you know, some whole grain breads and things like that. And then, um, yeah, then I'll probably watch some Netflix and go to sleep. Dude, 
Very exciting for me. Are you into boxing or MMA or any of that? Watching it? No, but I know you are. Um, I know you are. And I do get people that approach me all the time and they're like, hey, dude, MMA, you look like blah. And I'm like, I have no idea who that is. But um, yeah, no, I I definitely want to check out more of your your stuff. Like, I don't know that much about you yet, but um, yeah. The Jake Paul documentary on Netflix. You got to watch that. Yeah. All right. I'll check it out. You know, I think. Sometimes I think like um, I watch these videos on Twitter and shit. They're like, and they're like, you know, takedowns and like people just get in fights. And you see like the bully when they're like getting bullied and then they take down a huge guy. I like want to be. I want to know about fighting. Like I want to know how to fight. So I'm thinking about taking some courses. Like if anyone tries to fuck with me, I'm a big dude. But like I don't really know how to fight. So I'm interested maybe in taking some like jujitsu or some sort of, you know, martial don't arts. Don't take jujitsu. No. Jiu-jitsu is not applicable in the real world. The okay. two that are most applicable in the real world would be boxing or Krav Maga. Oh, right. But I would All say right. boxing is more your style because Krav Maga is very brutal. It's like yeah. inflicting like serious, serious damage. Oh, Whereas shit. if okay. you know how to box... You can just knock someone out with one punch and then that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll definitely have to check that out because I, I do want to be able to defend myself. And I also think it's important to have an extra, um, you know, um, cardio activity and just probably it's good for your mind too, I would think. Like, you know? It is good for your mind. The reason I'm laughing, do me a favor, go take like, one boxing class, like with the coach, not like cardio kickboxing class, but like boxing, boxing, your okay. legs will be more sore from the leg work than the most brutal, intense, like weightlifting session you've ever had. It is fucking wow. insane. I'm sh- I can only imagine, dude, I'm going to do it. <laughs> do it. Consider it done. So I'll get some lessons from you. <laughs> Come to Denver. Um, last question is someone asked, they want to know, do you have a regret that sticks out in your life? <laughs> I mean, we all have uh, plenty, but. Yeah, I have plenty of regrets, but, um, you know, one of them is like I, when my mom passed during COVID, I was, I had moved to Palm Springs. And I didn't get to see her except for like on the iPhone in her last moments. And that was really tough. Um, I was never really that close with my mom, but, you know, we, we tried to make it happen. I tried. She tried. So I do have a little regret about that. Um, uh, I have some. What else do I have regrets about? Uh, you know, I think I'm I'm pretty much I don't have a lot of regrets because I I'm I'm a creation that I've made of myself that I'm very proud of. I'm yeah, things have fucked up in my life, but like I'm stronger because of all that shit that I went through. So I wouldn't really say I have regrets at all. You know, like I think I wish I'd seen my mom when she passed, but that's about it. Yeah. It's a very, very mature answer. Yeah, it's true. So Anything and everything that you want to plug. Okay, so um, my handles are at Dolph Dietrich XXX on Instagram, at Dolph Dietrich on Twitter. Um, I have Snapchat, but I don't really use it that. No, I'm so sorry. Wait, I have TikTok, which I'm starting to make videos. That's at Dolph Dietrich. Um, Jack McEnroth, my partner, who's fucking brilliant at skincare an esthetician. He can do lasering, uh, facials, these, all this cool shit. Um, check him out. He's at Jack McEnroth on all of the platforms. He's known as skincare daddy, New York city. So he's got also at skincare daddy, NYC. Um, he works at an awesome spa called uh, therapy here in New York. So if you're interested in services to have your skin, uh, be glowing, uh, Botox, things like that, he's the guy to go to. Um, I'm doing a show coming up in Augusta, Georgia, uh, the 8th and 9th of September, I believe, excuse me, <clears throat> called the Inappropriate pool, pool Party, which is really fun. I'll be doing it with my buddy, Brian Bonds. I haven't seen oh. him in a while. He's a good friend of mine. 
and um, we're going to go down there and tear it up a little bit. I've done this this particular show this weekend like six times over the past 10 years, so they're having me back again. It's real fun. They get about five porn stars down there. Um, we hang out with the guests all weekend. We have special meet and greets. We do a live performance. Uh, it's really going to be fun for me to sort of get back and like see Brian and all my friends down there in Augusta, Georgia. So check that out. Inappropriate pool party at um, the uh, Parliament House, a Parliament Resort. <clears throat> and then lastly, like just follow me and check out my body modification, plastic surgery, things I have coming up. Uh, really looking forward to sharing that with you guys. If you're interested in more about the services, it's alphamaleplasticsurgery.com. Check it out. Dr. Steinbreck is the best. And um, that's all I got. Yeah. No, I can. I will say, like, I won't endorse anything I don't believe in. But I got to say, you guys definitely got to check out that plastic surgery site, which I'll link below in the comments. Because when Dolph said that to me, I, like, looked at it. I was like, what the fuck? I'm like, I called my fiance over. I was like, I didn't even know this shit was possible. Like, what the hell? Yeah, That's I didn't either. I really didn't. I was going to go in and I was going to have the liposuction done and I was going to have talk about chest in augmentation, yeah. maybe get some. I didn't really want implants at this point, but, uh, you know, I just want to tweak it. And then they told me this was the option. They're like, if we don't take that fat and use it somewhere else in your body, we throw it away. So they can put it in lots of places that you didn't think of. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. I'll be going from a, a nice little A cup to like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a C cup. I am not sure yet. So <laughs> you're going to be posting all that stuff on like your Instagram and, yeah, Twitter post, and all that. Yeah. Post my, my, my journey and what's happening with that. And, um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Okay. Oh, uh, shit. One last question. Uh, when are you guys getting married? I totally forgot that. Oh yeah. Oh, this is cool. Um, so it's going to be 2024. That's all I really know right now. Um, and we talked about what we're going to do and you know, he's more into like small things and I, I've already been married twice and he's not been married before. Um, so basically we decided what we do know, it's going to be in Las Vegas <clears throat> and the gift that we're going to give ourselves because it's all about us. It's our wedding, right? We're going to get tickets to Kylie Minogue's residency at Voltaire which tickets went on sale today and I hear you can't fucking get them. Uh, but we're going to get like a suite, like this package thing where we get like a beautiful suite and table side service to Kylie Minogue's um, tour. So that's to her. Yeah. Her music. She's doing a residency in, in Vegas. So wow. that's exciting. So that's how I know 2024. Uh -huh. It's going to be a good year. 2020 sucked. 21 sucked. 22 got a little bit better. 23 has been off the hook. So 24, I think, is just going to be great. Let's hope so. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this today, Dolph. You were a shit ton of fun, super energetic. Like, you didn't disappoint. Thanks. And if I can be honest, you're like, you are literally the one that got away. Because <laughs> there was like a list of like people that I wanted to film with. And you're like the one who just, oh, no, I'm going to quit fuck well I, that is true and um yeah i won't say that i don't look at your scenes and stalk you a little bit behind your back without with me thinking like damn he is fine, he is fine. oh shit big girthy meaty dick bald head big blue eyes oh anyways um on another note yep so there's that but uh well like i said i'm not, i'm you know retired from filming i'm not retired from being a pig so no? uh -huh. I will definitely let you know if I come to New York. And one last tiny thing, uh, Jack, does he do like fillers and stuff too, or no? He does. He oh. does. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the brand names, but he do, he does fillers, um, Botox, um, and a whole list of services that I don't really know much about. But um, okay. yeah, he does. All right, awesome. For those, thank you, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for those of you watching, I hope you guys all enjoyed this as much as I did. This was a ton of fun. If you have any questions, please let us know down below in the comments. Um, don't go anywhere. Uh, but I hope you guys have an amazing week.
Hey guys, just wanted to say thank you for watching this video, and if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button, and on the left-hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel. There are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord, and I personally answer that it is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos, the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff, it is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.